have said to me, are you sure about this subject? It seems a bit more complicated than that. Uh, because, of course, you, you could say that nowadays many people don't believe the Bible. Uh, my response has been, firstly, well, it's the subject you gave me, not when I chose myself. Uh, and secondly, though, on reflection, uh, it's that comment that people don't believe the Bible is actually very national. Uh, in the UK now, it, it's no longer the norm to believe the Bible. I, I can demonstrate that to you uh, with a, a very, very quick survey. Uh, and this comes from the, the general election that we had a few years ago, where the political parties were casting around for subjects uh, on which to address the uh, population of the UK. Uh, in other words, what was important, what was likely to motivate people to make a choice. Uh, and you can see there that the survey um, challenged people to ask themselves, well, what do you believe in terms of, of the Bible and the things it presents? And the, the result is a little bit depressing for those of us who do believe the Bible. You can see there, 32% of the people who were asked to fill in the poll came back and said, yeah, I do believe. 20% um, said, I, I believe in something, but I don't believe in God. 33% said, I, I don't believe and 14 were, were undecided. It is actually a little bit more concerning than that in some ways, in that if you break it down into the age groups, the 18 to 24s, less of them believed in God. Only a quarter of our 18 to 24-year-olds in this country, as represented by this poll, say that they would believe, whereas uh, plus 60 is 40%. Of course, when you get to over 60, you can get a bit confused and it seems that that's the way with this survey, because when the over 60s were asked, what is your religion, nearly 70% of them said, I'm a Christian. Remember, only 30-odd percent of them had said, I believe in God. So how you can be a Christian but not believe in God, I don't know. Um, but, but maybe it's just a, a reflection on the fact that people really don't know what they believe or haven't thought about whether they believe in the Bible now. And when it comes to other countries, actually, we are quite different, I think. Um, another statistic in this, uh, the, the, the poll which I looked at was uh, allegedly nine out of ten Americans still believe in God, which, when you compare to our statistics, is really quite concerning. I equally, you travel in Europe, France, Italy, Spain, the norm seems to be that people do still believe and do still go to, to some place of worship on a Sunday, but, but not for us. Of course, for us in the room, I think generally we would say, yes, we, we do believe. We may be in the minority, but we believe. And the reasons why we might believe, well, I guess we could have a poll, but I won't inflict that on you. I think it's a, a myriad of different personal reasons. I'll, I'll give you a couple of mine. Uh, and that one of them is, is, with a bit of a science background, just where we are helps me to believe in the Bible and that a God exists who wrote it and that a God exists who sent his son. There we are. Um, I know it doesn't look like this when you look around you, but that, that is where we are, planet Earth third from the sun. Anybody know what the zone is in that we, that we live in that, that actually means we can live at all? Scientists have a, a name for the, the distance from the sun which allows Earth, uh, life to be possible. No, no, no. You, you're th maybe thinking to, uh, to planet Earth-like. They call it the Goldilocks zone which I'm sure some of you will heard. Probably it was in the question rather than in the answer, the problem there. Yeah, the Goldilocks. So you remember Goldilocks and the three bears? Everything had to be just right. And when the scientists look at the universe, they say, well, do you know what? Planet Earth is in just the right spot to, to sustain life. If we were too close, it would be too hot. If we were too far away, well, it, we, we would be uh, too cold. Uh, Mars actually is about the right size as Earth, but it's just in the wrong place so that water can't exist, so they say, and therefore, well, there we are, right in, in the, the right spot. And that helps me to believe, because I simply can't imagine that it is a chance that, that we're in the right place uh, to sustain life. Uh, when you think about chances, it really is 
remarkable. Anybody know what, what the chances are if I put those Scrabble tablets in a, a bag and asked you to pull them out in the right order to spell there is no God? Do you, do you know what the chances are that you could do that? Yeah, it, it's, it, it's quite remarkable. Yeah, the did you say 120 million? Well done. You've done it before. It, isn't that remarkable? So there are those who would say, well, we're here in the right place, just the right amount of distance from the sun to sustain Earth by chance, because by chance a big bang occurred in the right place and all the right elements were there, the right amount of energy. Wasn't that lucky? And then I think, well, I, I have been lucky or for an occasion, but not that lucky. Uh, and just the chances of pulling the tablets out in, in the right order, the chances are amazing. You, you add a little bit more variability in there. You say, OK, well, I won't just put the tablets that spell there is a God in a bag. I'll put all the tablets from my Scrabble box in there. Do you know what the chances then? Is that trillion? 219 trillion, 378 billion, 59 million. And for me, that's a massive reason why I believe that it is not just chance. I cannot, I, to me, it takes much more faith to believe that this is a chance event than it does to look around me and think, hang on a minute, there must surely be some greater force that has caused this to be true. Of course, some of you will have no interest in science at all, and I'm at risk already sending you fast asleep. So I'll finish the science bit and just remind you that there are other good reasons why we might believe. That The Bible is full of reasons to believe and full of reasons why you can trust that it's worth believing in. Anybody know how many prophecies the Bible contains? So... Things where the Bible, a writer in the Bible has, has said, this will happen in the future. Well, I looked it up and there are various different suggestions, but a common number seems to be 2,500. 2,500 predictions in the pages of the Bible, which have been written for an awfully long time, where somebody has said, this will happen. And some of them are very specific. You, you look at Jeremiah's prophecy here about the, uh, the nation of Israel and what would happen to them. Um, and all of the details of who would take them, where they would be taken. You've got names, you've got time periods, you've got what would happen at the end of time periods. And all of that has proven to be true. Uh, and those are written by men who lived hundreds of years before events. Do you know, out of the two and a half thousand prophecies which the Bible contains, already 2,000 of them have come true. The 500 which remain all relate to, well, where we're going. The Bible says that the, the Lord Jesus will return, he will establish a kingdom, and if we believe, if we're interested, then a place in that kingdom can be ours. I guess that's another reason why some of us may well believe and be interested enough to look at this because of the, well, the implications of believing. Believing is a, a very important thing. I, I'm sometimes amazed how little we think about what we believe. Of course, what you believe dictates what your life will be like to a certain extent. How you approach life, how you view life, will define how you set about life. Henry Ford was a man who knew the importance of belief. He can who thinks he can, he can't who thinks he can't. And of course, if we don't set aside time to believe, or well, sorry, to think about what we believe, then the likelihood is that we, we won't come to a conclusion, we won't make a decision. But believing really is important. Napoleon knew, in, in terms of the Lord Jesus, how important it had been for people to believe. You'll be reminded, of course, as you read his words, that he was a man who had a fairly high opinion of himself. Uh, but he, he accomplished great things because he believed he could. And he says this about Jesus, I marvel that whereas the ambitious dreams of myself, Caesar, Alexander the Great, should vanish into thin air a Judean peasant, Jesus, should be able to stretch his hands across the centuries and control the destinies of men and nations. 
So, so what we believe is really very important. And day by day, year by year, what people believe ha has, well, shaped the world that we live in. You think about what you've seen in the newspapers and on your TV screens in the last few years and the results of what people believe. It is a group of, of migrants fleeing Syria. Why? Well, not because they've heard the weather is better. It's because they believe that in Europe a better life awaits them. That's not always the truth, of course. I was reading recently about a group of migrants who went to Finland and realized the weather really wasn't very good and have since gone back. But they, they're moving. They're moving their family. Uh, they're moving their, their careers, their, everything, because they believe that, that something better is waiting for them in Europe. And because they believe that where they're living now no longer has a future. But belief really is important. I said, didn't I, that one of the reasons that people might believe is the consequences. And the Bible sets about giving us those consequences in very clear language. These are reasons, if you like, to decide whether you believe or not, whether the Bible is worth believing. This is a survey just from the Gospel of John, uh, and some of the things that the Lord Jesus said to the people he talked to about the implications of, of just believing in him are remarkable. He said, if you believe in me, then you'll be part of the family of my father. Uh, and it became clear his father had a plan. So God's family planning was something that, that people be, could take part of by believing in his son. He told people, well, believe in me, you will never hunger or thirst. Not, not that there aren't people who believe in Jesus and are hungry or, or thirsty. What he meant there was you, you'll feel fulfilled. You won't feel empty. Your life will have meaning. You'll live, even though you might die. There's a, an amazing consequence of believing in the word of God and in his uh, God's son who is presented you choose to go down this route, and by God's grace, you can live forever. You'll see the glory of God. In other words, you remember I said we believed that Jesus will come back to establish his Father's kingdom on earth? We'll see it. That, that's an amazing one. You'll perform greater miracles than uh, the Son of God. You read the pages of the Gospels, you see Jesus raising people from the dead, walking upon the water, controlling the weather. And yet Jesus turned around on one day and said, by the way, if you choose to believe in me, you'll do greater things than you see me do. You'll not be troubled or afraid. Not, not that it can't be scary sometimes, that, that people who believe don't have problems in life that the meaning there behind Jesus' words were, well, if you fear my father, if you respect him, if you revere him, then ultimately you have nothing else to be concerned about. Just believe that, that he has a plan and he will bring it to fruition. You shall be full of joy. So, so there are a series of reasons which the Son of God himself gave for people to take the issue seriously, to open the words of God's word, sorry, open the pages of God's word and, well, get an opinion, you might say. Some of those on the list, you might say, well, I could get those from, from other places. If I work hard, I might not be hungry or thirsty in the UK. That, that's true. The, the things that we believe in can deliver some of the promises which the Lord Jesus made, but not all of them. There are some implications of choosing to believe that God's word is his word, which nothing else can deliver. There are great promises made, aren't there, by all sorts of companies and products and countries, but nobody else in the world is offering that eternal life. Of course, when the Bible talks about believe, it doesn't just say, get an opinion. 
it also says, do something about it. This is another brief survey, a biblical survey this time, about, well, the word, the use of the word believe. And you can see there that the word is used in all four Gospels, but the Gospel of John uses it more than all of the other Gospels put together. And you think, okay, so John had a favorite word, but it was more than that. You see, the way John used the word believe was always as a verb. He said, do belief. So when John talks about Jesus addressing belief, he wasn't just saying, have an opinion. He wasn't just saying, know what I'm saying. He was saying, do something about what I'm saying. And that's why it's so important. Of course, we also need to look at the flip side for, for a moment. That there are a series of reasons which I've given already as to why people may believe in the Bible. But the Bible also gives a, a reason or an implication of choosing not to. You see it there. He who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And not to dwell on them, but for completeness, if you do the same survey of John's gospel and say, okay, well, what happens if I don't believe? Well, you, you do get a list of consequences, which is why it is so worthwhile to, to take the time to know, to consider what we believe. So, you know, it does make me so cross that there are men uh, in the world today who rob people of the opportunity to decide what they believe. Men like Richard Dawkins, for example, who are their basic, the essence of their message is, you don't need to think about this. I'm a clever man. I work at Oxford University. I've done the thinking for you. There's the answer. Move on. Uh, and yet what he's doing is, well, he is robbing all of us all, of, all the, the people on earth are of the, uh, the opportunity to decide for themselves what they believe. Uh, and I believe God has put us in this place for a, a limited amount of time. It's a limited offer for each one of us. We only have the opportunity to work out what we believe for a certain time period before we're dead. Uh, and to not give that the, the, the reasonable time is, well, it, it's, it's criminal. It's a real shame. Of course, some might say, ah, oh, yeah, but for me, there is no point spending any more time on this matter because it's, well, too, too late. Or, or th there are reasons which I, I've come across where people will say, I don't need to make the time to decide what I believe. And I just want to look at three examples of people who Jesus met who could have arguably had a, a good reason not to need to know what they believe. And yet, when we look at them, we'll see that Jesus accepted no valid reason as not working out what we believe. Because I should say, whether we decide to believe in Jesus or not does not mean that he did not live that he was not a real man, that he isn't going to come back and establish his father's kingdom. What we choose to believe really just defines how we react. Uh, and it, it may well be that many who've decided not to believe in Jesus are going to be surprised when he, he appears. And it transpires that he was a real man and he did have a real task from his father. But, but let's have a look at a, a couple of people who he came into contact with, who, who you might have said had good reason not to give this reasonable time. Have, have a look at John chapter 8, for example. For there we meet a lady who you might certainly have said Jesus um, could have dismissed, uh, that he might have said to this particular person in these set of circumstances, actually... You don't need to decide. John chapter 8, verse 2. This is a lady that the Lord Jesus met early in one morning. Early in the morning, Jesus came again to the temple, and all the people came unto him. And he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery. 
in the very act. Now, what transpires here is that, that uh, a challenge is being set for the Lord Jesus. You might even say a, a trap, because the law of Moses, which the um, Israelites were living to at this time, the Jews, was very specific. It said, if a couple is found in adultery in the very act, which is why these scribes and Pharisees are so very specific, they should be put to death. The problem for Jesus was that the Roman Empire, who was in control at this time, had, had taken that authority away from the Jews. So they weren't at liberty to assign the death penalty. So you've got a, a perfect trap here being constructed for Jesus. He could say, the law, the Jewish law says kill her, in which case people will say, ah, the Romans say you can't do that. Or equally, he could say, well, actually, we can't do that at the moment, in which case they'd have said, oh, you're, you're not following our religious law. The perfect reason, then, for Jesus to say, actually, this is an irrelevant question for this woman because of the way she's lived her life. But he doesn't do that. Verse 5, the, the scribes and Pharisees knew the trap they were setting. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. Lots of people have uh, thought about what Jesus might have written in the sand. The, the truth is, we don't know. So, some have said, well, Jesus knew everything, so he knew the names of all the people in the crowd. So, so maybe he started writing names of people in the crowd and then a key word about something they'd done wrong. So, for instance, if there was an Eliezer in the crowd who had stolen a donkey at some point in his life, the suggestion is that Jesus wrote in the dust, Eliezer, donkey, question mark, and Eliezer decided that this wasn't for him and departed. So some have said it's more complicated than that. And in fact, Jesus um, was referring to a, an article of the law that says... Don't be involved in skullduggery. Don't set traps. Thou shalt not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. And maybe that is what he wrote. We don't know. Others have said, well, remember at this time in the courts, the Roman uh, procurator would write his verdict and then stand up and deliver his verdict. So maybe Jesus was already writing, he that is not guilty or, uh, cast the first stone. We don't know. But what we do know is that at the end of the, the sequence of events, Jesus and the woman were left alone with a crowd watching on to see what he would do. And so the woman was left with the one person who could condemn her because he was sinless. And what does he say? Verse 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So, so though we may say, Well, there's no point in me having a, an opinion. It's too late for me. Actually, when you look at the way Jesus dealt with this woman... It certainly wasn't too late for her. In fact, another reason I believe in the word of God and in the son of God is because he believed in people. And so even when I make mistakes, and even when I think, surely I should be doing better, I have confidence that, that Jesus is a man who can forgive and was always prepared to work with people, to, to encourage them to think harder. What about a, another person that Jesus came into contact with who you might have thought he would let off the hook in terms of their decision-making processes? Have a look, look at Luke chapter 10. I think in these days, 
one of the reasons that, that people would give uh, as to why they haven't made time to know what they believe would simply be that they haven't got the time to make time to know what they would believe. But Martha was a, a woman who was exceptionally busy, uh, and yet Jesus was keen that she understand the priorities in her life. Luke 10, verse 38, it came to pass as they went that Jesus entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to Jesus and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. We're not quite sure the sequence of events here, but it seems as if Mary and Martha had been working together, because Martha says, she's left me, don't, don't, you, don't you care about that? Uh, and yet, here, the Lord Jesus doesn't, he doesn't give her an excuse, Martha, to not think about what's important. He, he could have said, Martha, you're clearly too busy, today's a, a busy day for you, We'll talk about this another time. Do you know, every time I say to my wife, let's talk about this another time, what I really mean is, let's hope that you forget and we don't talk about this another time. J Jesus didn't take that opportunity. He, he worked with busy people to try to bring them to a point of decision. Verse 41, Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. In other words, Jesus was reminding Martha of why she might be busying herself looking after him. Because he was the son of God worth looking after and paying attention to. Uh, and so he didn't scold her for saying, I'm too busy, what do you think my sister's doing? He tried to, to bring her to, to get perspective as to what, what was the important decisions and things she should be talking about. But Martha was obviously a very honest woman. She, she, we'd say she wore her heart on her sleeve. Because there, there's another occasion where we meet her again, and this time she's not too busy, she's just too angry. That, that's my reading of it anyway. Have a quick look. John chapter 11. And there we... we coming further in the Lord Jesus' ministry and people are uh, reacting to him in more extreme ways. There were those who believed him and followed him and had given up all for him. There were others who, who simply wanted him out of the equation. John 11 verse 1, now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and his sister, her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was sick therefore his sister sent unto him saying Lord behold he whom thou lovest is sick we haven't got time to read the whole chapter but what we're told is that Jesus delays for a while the, the disciples were very pleased that Jesus had delayed because going to see Mary and Martha meant that he was going to go back into the, the heartland of his enemies you can review the, the last few chapters in the Gospel of John and you'll see that he was already, or he had been stoned or people had tried to stone him and he'd walked away, he'd walked out of the crowd. But, but he was going back into dangerous territory. Jesus had a very clear view on why he might delay, uh, why he might consider going back at all. He says in verse 15, when the news of Lazarus' death arrived, he says, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent ye may believe. See, the Lord Jesus himself recognized that it was important that his disciples knew what they believed, that they had an opinion, that they were prepared to do something about it. It, it seems that Martha had an opinion when Jesus returned a little later than she'd hoped. You look at verse 18, John 11. Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off, and many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. 
Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast laid sorry, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. I guess when we read the pages of scriptures, some of us might have different pictures as to how things transpired. I have a picture here in my own mind of Martha uh, with one hand on her hip and the other one shaking her, uh, her finger. I imagine she could well have been very cross. She knew Jesus had saved people and healed people in the past. She'd sent word to him because she believed he could do that for her sister, her brother. But, but t- time had, had not been kind. You might imagine that Jesus presented with such a challenge, perhaps with a, a cross friend, lady, might might have said, Martha, the time is not right to talk of such things. But but he didn't do that. But verse 23, Jesus said unto Martha, thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Again, I have a picture of Martha almost saying there, don't give me religion now, you're late. It's too late. But, but however these events came together, you, you just f- focus on how Jesus treats her. Again, he doesn't say, let's talk about this when you're feeling more rational, when the level of emotion is lower. You remember what he says, verse 25, Jesus said unto Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way. Isn't that remarkable that Jesus, he managed to hold a conversation with Martha in which at the end she been reminded of what she believed herself. The the word believe actually comes eight times in in the next few verses. Jesus had engineered this sequence of events to help people understand, to to help people consider what they believed. And in deciding for herself, Martha, that she believed that this was the Son of God, well, Jesus had helped her to to move into that group of people who were willing to do something about it, that by being baptized in his name, she, Martha could look forward to Jesus returning to establish the kingdom. Let's have a, a look at our last man then. Be, because it, it might be said that, that in a country where so few people will now say, I believe that the Bible is the word of God, that it, it, it could be an embarrassing thing for somebody to say, do you know what, I do. So sometimes I, I talk to our young people and you get that feeling that there is a little bit of hesitance to, to stand out from the crowd, to make that sort of announcement. And perhaps Nicodemus had a similar challenge. We don't know, but perhaps he did. Just come back to John chapter 3. Remember, Nicodemus was a man who came to the Lord Jesus late at night, and some have suggested the reason was to be seen near the Lord Jesus. There are other reasons, I think, why it might have been, but let's just remind ourselves of the man again. John 3, verse 1, there was a a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher, Come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou dost, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Remember those consequences? It's only when we decide that we believe in God's word, that we believe that he had a son, that that his son was sent, that to be baptized into that son... Is, is a relevant thing to do, that, that it allows us to, to become closer to him, to look toward the future. Well, that's what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus. You need to understand what it is that you believe. We're told that he's a, 
a leader of the Jews, aren't we? Um, in verse 1, a ruler of the Jews. I think he was more than that. You look down um, at verse 10, uh, and we're told that he was a, a master of Israel. Now, Nic Nicodemus then, a member of the Sanhedrin, the leading council of his time, was a very important man. My understanding is that in the Sanhedrin there were three positions which were the really powerful positions. And one of them, the title was the leader of Israel. So, so it could be then that Nicodemus had come under the cover of darkness because he couldn't possibly be seen to be considering such things, well, in this position. Actually, though, I think Nicodemus was a a more sincere man than that, that, that he was a thinking man and that he had made time to think about these things, even if he was so busy he had to come late at night because I think he wanted Jesus' full attention so that he could work with him and, and, well, and come to a conclusion as to what he believed. And the verses before we meet him might... might actually agree with that. John 2 verse 23, we're told of Jesus, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles that he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. And there's a play on words there. Verse 23, we're told many believed in him. Verse 24, actually the words there literally are, he did not believe on them. And you think, hang on a minute, if this is a, a talk supposed to be about the, the, the merits of believing in God's word and why it's important to believe in Jesus, how come we've got Jesus here not believing in people who believed on him? But, but I think it's more that Jesus, Jesus wasn't just looking for people to, to take a quick glance at what he was and what he could do and say, I'm in that club. That's something that, that I think might be. He wanted thinking men and women who, who wouldn't just say, I believe, but would do something about what they believed. And that was the sort of man that Nicodemus was. We know that, don't we? Because Jesus encouraged him to, to think. He explained to him that only by being born again could a man enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, and to be born again was a two-stage process. It was to, to be baptized, to, to recognize that sin needed to be washed away, and that the Lord Jesus, what he was doing on earth, could, would accomplish that. But also to be born of the Spirit is more to, to have a change in outlook, to, to take on a different set of influences, to believe that this is God's word written by his power, and to make it the basis of our lives. And Nicodemus certainly did that. You look at John chapter 19. If he enters under the cover of darkness, and some have said he was skulking around, he was protecting his interests, by the end of his encounter with the Lord Jesus, Nicodemus certainly knew who he was. Who he was, the, the ruler of Israel, but also who Jesus was. Verse 38, John 19. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He, he came therefore and took the body of Jesus, and there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight, then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulchre, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulchre was nigh at hand. And there, of course, was Nicodemus, a, a man who was acting now entirely on what he had come to believe. Did he lose his job because of it? I think it's very likely. Did he, he hide from it, or did he try to conceal his identity? Absolutely not. And 
he had, of course, adopted a different way of life. It was Napoleon, again, who, who reflected on the change or, or the difference that men and women who believed in the Lord Jesus manifest compared to people who believed in other things, including himself. You can see, again, he likes to name other big names. He, he likes to, uh, to remind you of his own importance. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I, myself, have founded great empires. But upon what did these creations of our genius depend? See, he's, he's definitely not a, a hiding... Uh, Lily, is he? That's not the word. You know, the, whatever it is. He's certainly not concealing his own talent. But he recognises that all he had accomplished, he accomplished by force. Jesus alone founded his empire upon love. And to this very day, millions would die for him. And of course, that is still true today. It might not feel in this country as if there are millions who have decided that Jesus is for them. But on the global scale, that is absolutely still the case. There are millions of people who live their lives having decided that the Lord Jesus is the Son of God. There are different groups, uh, that there are different uh, churches, but, but there are millions of people who have made time to think and to decide whether the Son of God is the basis for, for there. And so th there are all sorts of reasons, as I said. There's science, uh, there's uh, the, the consequences, there's the chances. Uh, and yet to me, well, the, the reason I believe, I, I guess really, is quite simple. It gives my life purpose. I don't want to get to the, the end of my life and think, is that it? Is that all there was? And yet by adopting the Lord Jesus and believing that this is God's word written to outline his plan, to tell us where we came from, to tell us where we're going to, it gives my life great purpose. And though it might sometimes feel a little busy, uh, at least I, I feel that, that in my life this makes perfect sense uh, and is something worth living for and the more people I can encourage to at least think about this to decide what they believe the, the better I'll feel